Hi everyone, today I'm going to take you through the case study of Nike. This case study describes Nike's response to market and competitive challenges, as well as it focuses on Phil Knight's leadership role. Before moving to this case study, I would request you to subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube in order to get my recent case study video updates on time. This video is also enabled with English subtitles for your better understanding. Now let's move to the case study. In the 1950s and in the early 1960s, one German company dominated the American shoe market. They had no challenging competitor, yet athletes were not getting shoes what they wanted and they were buying what was available in the market. Giant shoe manufacturer dictated the market. None of the big companies was willing to solve the problem faced by athletes. In this scenario, in the year 1964, Phil Knight, a track athlete who had just graduated out of college, started a company called Blue Ribbon Sports in partnership with his track field coach, Bill Bowerman. With an initial investment of just $1,000 and began to sell Tiger brand sports shoes imported from a Japanese manufacturer with an aim to improve the lives of people. The Tiger sale continued to rise rapidly every year. At the same time, Phil began to face problems with the Japanese manufacturer. Finally, he was forced to start manufacturing his own brand of shoes in the year 1971 under the name of Nike. The first and foremost factor for sustainable competitive advantage is to position your brand inside a consumer's mind. The ways to enter their mind is either by becoming a leader in an existing product or service category or becoming first in any new product or service category. In other words, you need to create a new category. Bill Bowerman, Nike's co-founder, was a famous track and field coach in the 1950s and 1960s. He had constantly motivated his wards to develop a winning attitude. For winning, speed is the defining factor and he strongly believed that shoes played a major role. Unfortunately, he was not happy with the shoes available in the market. To increase speed, Bowerman took upon himself to redesign the existing shoes to make them lighter. Lightness means less burden while running and the athlete could devote all those extra energies into increasing the speed. At the same time, long distance running was also becoming popular and shoes that could last the race was hard to find. Being a runner himself, Phil Knight's target segment was consumers like him. The runners. For them, he had to find a shoe that would be lighter, comfortable, that would help in longer distance running and at a price lower than the German brands in the market. In the early 1960s, running for fitness wasn't popular. It was believed that only crazy people would run for pleasure or exercise. Runners were mocked at that time. Nike's original founders, Bowerman and Phil Knight, firmly believed that people could live a healthier and a longer life if they could run for a few miles every day. Their mission was not to earn profits but to educate customers about the joy of running. Bowerman promoted the concept of running as a fitness routine, including people of an advanced age through writing articles in magazines. He also created a running program in Eugene that became a national model for fitness programs. In the year 1966, he wrote a book titled Jogging, which preached the benefits of jogging and the techniques. In that book, Bowerman never spoke about blue ribbon or its shoes. He spoke what was important for the readers, but the book brought enough publicity for the company. Because of the book, running was no longer just for crazy people, but for everyone. The market for shoes expanded beyond athletes. By educating customers, 
Nike created a new market where competition was literally non-existent. By the time the competitor entered the market, Nike had already laid a strong foundation in the minds of the people. Today, in this hyper-competitive market, great brands no longer depend only on innovation or creativity in order to attract a new market or to maintain the existing market. They need to satisfy the emotional desires, cultural orientation, and needs of their clients. Jeff Johnson, who was Phil's first sales partner, built customer data files from the beginning. He created an index card for each and every individual where he entered customers' personal information, shoe size, shoe preference, and their individual likings. This database enabled Johnson to keep in touch with all his customers at all times. He sent them Christmas cards, birthday cards, notes of congratulations after they completed a big race or a marathon. Many of Johnson's customers voluntarily shared their feedback about the shoes with suggestions, which helped Johnson to tweak the shoe design. As their feedback was implemented, the customer felt happy and became enthusiastic partners in promoting the brand and also offered help in finding solutions to other problems. Co-creation was one of the important reasons for Nike's success as their shoes became better than any other competitor. The heart of Nike's sustainable competitive strategy or success is its ability to innovate and this was possible through their integrated process of experimentation. Bowerman in the 1940s being a track field coach, Bowerman was passionate about winning and he began experimenting with footwear. He cross-sectioned existing racing shoes with the brand saw and examined their anatomy. Bowerman used to add some features in instep or midsole or some other place in the existing shoes and stitch them back up and then he would ask his wards to run wearing those shoes. He had constantly used his runners as his test subjects. He continuously monitored the performance of his shoes along with his runners performance. In the initial years of Blue Ribbon Incorporation, Bowerman kept making new designs and sent those prototypes, sketches, and drawings to the Japanese manufacturer. Jeff Johnson also experimented with shoe designs. Johnson constantly requested Phil to open a retail store until he agreed. He then experimented with the design and layout using the retail stores. By experimentation, Johnson and Bowerman gained a lot of new insights and knowledge. Cortez was one of the results of Bowerman's experiments. In the year 1965, one of the Bowerman's athlete's foot got injured when he unknowingly misstepped into the path of a passing teammate in a long-distance race. That injury led to a stress fracture in one of the metatarsal bones. Bowerman ripped apart the athlete's shoe and saw that the shoe had spongy cushioning in the heel and the forefoot but zero arc support. Moreover, the outer sole was wearing faster, forcing the metatarsals to bend until it snaps. Bowerman began experimenting. He noticed that the midsole remained solid on one of the Tiger Sport shoes. He took the midsole and fused it with Athlete's shoe's outsole. He then further cushioned the inner sole, added a soft sponge rubber in the forefoot and the top of the heel, and then a hard sponge rubber in the middle of the heel. Bowerman then sent the prototype to Japan manufacturer. The Japanese team had reservations against inserting rubber sponge at the heel, but Bowerman prevailed, insisting that it would be the first shoe to take off the pressure from a trails. The new design was manufactured and launched, thus Cortez was born. Cortez was the first product that became too popular, catapulting Nike into the minds of people. 
Bowerman began to search for a shoe that would be suitable for multiple surfaces. He began experimenting. One day while having breakfast, his eyes caught the waffles iron gridded pattern and a thought stuck in his mind. What if you reversed the pattern and formed the material with the raised waffle grid nubs? Bowerman went on to use the waffle iron part as a pattern and began molding process. After multiple setbacks, he got a workable prototype of outer sole with the hard rubber projections in the form of gridded pattern and he then shoved it to one of his runner's shoes. He made the athlete run in those shoes. The runner raced like a rabbit against uneven surfaces as well as over the synthetic turf. The new design vastly improved traction. Nike gave the shoes for trial during US Olympics track and field trials held at Eugene. Both athletes and everyday runners liked the product and concept spread like a wildfire. The waffle trainer went on to revolutionize the athletic shoe industry. As Cortez and waffle trainer was transforming the shoe aesthetics, more and more influencers began using it as everyday wear. Elton John NWA and Snoop Dogg wore Cortez in all their programs. Cortez played a major role in the iconic movie Forrest Gump. In the TV shows of the 1970s and 1980s, many of the main characters were wearing Nike shoes all the time. Phil Knight understood the value of style makers and influencers who guaranteed visibility and brand loyalty. He began to sign deals with the influencers, which further firmly positioned the Nike in the minds of people. Phil observed that many athletes did not make enough money to help them to compete at a higher level as well as to live a comfortable life in the later years. The bigger brands like Adidas, Puma were sponsoring only famous athletes. Phil began to support young athletes financially and also through offering other sources like people, equipment, facilities, etc. It started as a noble act. One of the young athletes who impressed Phil Knight and Bowerman, a passionate, fastest middle distance runner in America. Phil admired Prefontaine as once in a generation phenomenon. As Pre was struggling financially, Blue Ribbon offered him a job for $5,000 annually. The company supported him with other facilities too. Prefontaine grew into a superstar. He was doing the races in Nike gear and was also winning. Wherever he went, he wore Nike's t-shirt and shoes. After observing the sponsorship benefits, Phil Knight extended the endorsement strategy to other local and national runners as well as their coaches. As the performance of athletes are easily understandable for everyone, linking the product to their performance drastically helped in spreading the brand name through word of mouth. In the year 1987, Nike's ad agency made a new TV spot celebrating Nike's yearly role in founding the jogging craze. People from Nike and the ad agency felt that the ad is striking and proactive. But when they previewed it to a group of consumers, the ad met with silence. Nike's founder, Phil Knight, was upset. Next time, the ad agency came out with revised ads showing all kind of athletes doing what athletes do. Every athlete spoke with emotion about what they do, what emotional rewards they gained, and what they do it in their own emotional words, followed by just do it. The ad was not about sneakers, superior performance, or breakthrough innovations of Nike products. It was about emotional rewards about just doing it, whatever he or she feels like doing. It's just do it tagline and its accompanying advertisement challenged people to achieve their goals and aspirations. Many took up fitness, quit bad jobs, left bad relationships, and took up their own 
other pending aspirations. After being successful in building a brand in running shoes, Phil Knight began to explore whether Nike could export its core competencies, skills, and capabilities to any adjacent market and create new value propositions with new customers. From 1971, Nike began to rigorously observe and study requirements of football players. In 1978, Nike Football Boot was launched. Similar to the running shoe business, Phil signed deals with divisional college teams, schools, younger players, and coaches. Soon, Nike began sponsoring top professional European football clubs like Aston Villa, which went on to clinch Europe's top club prize wearing Nike boots. Then Nike began to sign top athletes to promote the brand. As Nike began to establish a leading position in the football shoe market, it launched an apparel line endorsed by the sports top athletes. Then later, Nike got into equipment and accessories. Once it became successful in America, Nike began to sell its football products in other countries as well. Later, they expanded beyond the USA to the global market. In golf, Nike first established a leading position in golf shoes. Nike then launched a clothing line endorsed by top athletes like Tiger Woods. Then the company began to manufacture and sell higher margin equipment like golf clubs, etc. In the 1960s, Adidas and Puma stagnated because there was no challenging competition. Nike grew fast because competition forced it. Phil Knight wrote that competition is always a good thing that is always brings out the best in people, but that's only true of people who can forget the competition. Phil Knight was lucky that he had two giant shoe manufacturers in the field who provoked him to grow the brand rapidly. Thank you all for watching this video. See you soon with another interesting case study. For more such case studies, please subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube.